Hi, everybody. This is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, we have Furkan Dandia. He's a therapist, podcaster, author, and men's group facilitator. Uh, He has 20 years of experience working in the corporate world as an engineer, and then around 30, he became a father, and he started to question his purpose in life and wanted to know and find out some more meaning. Uh, Then he got a divorce around 35, same age as I did, and failing in the void of hedonism, as he words it, he pulled himself out to finally align himself with his purpose in life. Now he puts his mental, physical, and spiritual health at the forefront while embodying discipline, integrity, consistency, and hard work. He has a website, which you can find in the notes. He also has a successful podcast that I have been on and love, and uh, he writes a cool substack um, about religion and philosophy, which I also love. So I'm a big fan of all things for con and welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me here and looking forward to what we're going to talk about here today. Yeah. Before we get any further, I ask every guest this question. Um, how old are you? Where did you grow up and what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Wow. Okay. So I'm 41. I grew up, so I spent majority of my youth in Montreal, which is in Canada, and a lot of people are familiar with uh, that city. And then I spent five years of my teenage years um, in Pakistan, in Karachi, and then I moved back to Montreal to start university at the age of 19 when I was going into engineering. Uh, As far as generation-wise, I probably put myself in the tail end of the millennials but uh yeah i think that should cover it awesome well you just gave me enough questions the last four hours but we'll try to get through them briefly um i guess the first question because this is a direct link is uh since you spent what i would consider the quite formative adolescent years in pakistan Mm -hmm. i'm curious do they have like air quotes generations there i know the word generation exists but like do they do what we in America tend to do, which is like label each other as like, I'm from this group, I'm from this one? Um, they may now. It's been quite some time. Mm-hmm. Like I moved back in uh, 2002 and and then I have visited three times. My last visit was in 2009. And, and then now I don't really have any immediate family or, or extended family for that matter left there, uh, apart from some uncles and aunts. But um, at the time when I was there, there, there wasn't a lot of labeling. I think people just didn't know the difference. And uh, it, it's a very, as you can appreciate that part of the world, the culture is very collectivistic. So the the idea is just everyone is one unit. There's no individuality there. Um, you kind of grow up within the family. And, and then we, and again, things have changed, obviously, that yeah, they yeah. tried to become more westernized. But yeah, that was kind of it. We we spent weekends, every holiday, all together at my grandma's house. All the cousins would be together. And there was really no notion of generation there. And I think, again, we, we kind of like look up to the elders for guidance and direction, rightfully or wrongfully. Mm-hmm. You kind of respect their opinions. And and then you kind of, yeah, you adopt a lot of the values that are passed down to you. You don't necessarily question a lot of it which um also impacted my adult life as i was navigating some of the things you touched on already especially divorce Mm -hmm. Uh, that definitely came into play for sure yeah so and we're gonna get there for sure (laughs) um uh second question because it totally matters to me for two reasons one i was an esl teacher for 10 years and i'm like in love with languages Mm -hmm. and language teaching and language acquisition you uh i am guessing but i would love for you to uh elaborate is it safe to assume based on your place of birth and what we just discussed that you speak Urdu, French and English fluently? Yeah. So I could, I speak Urdu fluently. I can't write it or read it. Okay. Funny enough. Um, (laughs) Yeah. uh, So I just, I I grew up speaking Urdu at home and my parents made sure my siblings and I all spoke, spoke in Urdu at home because they were of the mind that we'll eventually learn English in school anyways. So I didn't actually pick up, English fully until I was in grade two or three, uh, which <laughs> brought another set of challenges in <laughs> yeah. kindergarten grade one. A lot of the times I was just using uh, hand signals to communicate with uh, with my peers. So that was definitely a challenge there. Um, so and then French was a uh, my my dad immigrated at a time where 
my parents were able to choose what type of schooling I, uh, I went to. So most of my schooling growing up was in English. So I learned French as a second language, as most Canadians do. I obviously had more exposure being in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the French I did pick up was just through playing hockey as a kid. So it wasn't functional French. It it served a purpose in in the game of hockey. Uh, And then I've been out in Western Canada for the last 17, 18 years. So I never really got a lot of my friends that were English speaking. They ended up staying there. Um, and then they obviously learned French through work and I didn't get that opportunity. So my French at best is, I, I mean, I can understand majority of it and get my way through if I needed to. Uh, but, um, yeah. And my current wife, she's fully fluent in French. So it's funny. Uh, I'm learning a lot more from her now That's uh, cool. because we've been married for almost a year now. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. This is crazy how much we have in common. And we discussed some of this, but I didn't realize how much we have. So I was yeah. 35 when I got my divorce. I also have a son from that marriage. Um, and then I got remarried at exactly 40 and I'm now 43. So I'm older mm-hmm. than you. So it's like adding up now, the mm-hmm. big difference and I'm not implying that you are or not is I ended up on very much on purpose, having two more children. Um, and I, I love mm-hmm. all my kids. So I'm curious, are you, interested in having more kids or are you pretty good no absolutely i'm open to it Mm -hmm. um i'm definitely open to it but it's just we'll see you know it's one of those things now both my wife and i are at that age where especially for her you don't know right because she's also she's about a year younger than me so it's just uh at this point it's tough to say but she she's never had children so and, and i would love to go through that again uh, it definitely was a different experience, as you can appreciate, going <laughs> yeah. through a separation divorce when my son was four years old. Oh, yeah. So I've definitely missed those formative years for him, too. And I, I do get to see him, but it's not like I, I, I would say my parenting time is about 20%. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so definitely, I would love to go through that experience again and, and have more children. But I've kind of left it up to whatever is in the cards. And, and we'll see what happens. That's like the best attitude you could have. And I will just say that my wife, uh, a week before she turned 39, had our first daughter. And then two months before she turned 41, she just had our other daughter. So yeah, just to you know, throw out the numbers and the age and stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a fun question, but it's actually to me very poignant for the following questions I'm going to start asking you about your life in psychology and your relationship to religion. Pakistan and Montreal and Vancouver, British Columbia, Western Canada. I could not think of three places that have more of a separate reputation, um, basically based on liberalism versus conservatism. Uh, I'm curious, do you feel like all three are very different? Do you feel like two of them are closer? Like, What are just kind of your thoughts on the three subcultures that you have lived among? So just one clarification. Sure. My current city of residence is Calgary, Alberta. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, but I'm, I'm very close yeah. to Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. And actually, Calgary is pretty um, conservative so, comparatively, right? Or am I wrong? Yes. Yeah, okay. More so, yeah, more so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely i would say all three are very different and unique in their own ways um i mean pakistan has a huge religious influence within the culture mm-hmm. as much as a lot of people are pushing back and trying to find their own identity uh montreal was definitely different uh, for me it always felt like a party town and it still has that reputation <laughs> anytime People go to Montreal, they're, you know, excited about the nightlife and the party there. Mm-hmm. And, and Calgary's just had this reputation of being an oil and gas yeah. <laughs> city and hub. And and now it's kind of more so on the map because I'm seeing a huge population influx. I think in general, population in Canada is growing, but a lot of people are moving out to this part of the country because cost of living has been relatively cheaper uh, real estate has been relatively cheaper and, and we're seeing a huge influx here. So I think the culture is going to change because even when I'm driving out to the mountains, I see license plates from all parts of the country. So definitely a lot of movement. So you, as you can appreciate, that's going to change the culture too. But yeah, it's always had this oil and gas type of thing. It's kind of like mini Texas almost uh, without the <laughs> the guns. 
but uh, yeah, it's it's. I would say all three have been different, which has served me well because it's allowed me, looking back, moving so much at uh, at a young age. I changed a lot of schools too when I was living in Montreal. A lot of that helped me adapt, and I can often see that difference. Whereas, you know, if I'm traveling with my wife, for example, uh, when I'm in even in different countries, I'm able to quickly make friends or talk to people and mm. figure my way around. And and I think a lot of it is just from having that flexibility early in life and changing my environment so much that I have to figure out how to put myself out there and learn how to uh, communicate to people. And I think it's my temperament as well in general that I'm fairly open and I'm willing to learn from mm-hmm. others and, and respect other people's opinions. So that's definitely helped me and, and also navigating these various cultures I've been a part of. That's really cool. And that was a great answer. Um, and I've been kind of like hinting at like the main stuff I want to talk to you about, which is your work in psychology yeah. and also just what I call or maybe people call self-help. Mm-hmm. I, I loosely use that term because I don't like the connotations it brings, especially to Americans, but I actually mm-hmm. believe in it and, and love it. I just think it it's hard to discuss it without people like rolling their eyes at this point, thanks to mainly Instagram. Yeah, fair enough. But I think like by going through all this background and, and people hearing your patient, kind and intelligent approach to all things in life, I think they'll see why I'm a fan of yours because I think people like you can really help people when you have the training you have in psychology and then you also have what I would call like the S hits the fan divorce and all that because it's like, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people who like expect their therapy partner or their coaches or like stuff to like lead perfect lives and i think that's the i'm gonna say this i think that's a really naive approach to this Mm -hmm. this issue because it's the opposite you want someone with experience with conflict experience with Mm -hmm. like all of that so i am curious what was it like to have your credentials and to have your career and then also have your personal life not be going the way. I mean, I'm not saying it fell apart because that's not, a, I don't even mm-hmm. know if that's true and, and B that's such mm-hmm. a weird assumption, but like mm-hmm. no matter what it didn't end out, you know, you, you got married and then it, it didn't work. You got a divorce. So can you kind of walk us through that? However you want to. Yeah, absolutely. I think looking back, I think it was the, in fact, I was talking to my wife about it last night too, like going through a divorce was definitely a rewarding experience because it taught me a lot about myself. It uh, gave me a sense of humility that I didn't have. And just for context, uh, I graduated from engineering, probably like one of the top students. I got hired by a fortune 500 company right out of school. So things were like pretty good. And I mean, I still had to work really hard for all of it, but I was still blessed to get these opportunities. Whereas others, weren't right and I went to mm-hmm. McGill University in Montreal where wow. you know it's a highly wow. sought after engineering school so so I was given these opportunities and I still made I also made the most of it right whereas others didn't but um it was almost like things were always great like I worked hard and yes I got the I got the rewards and then I was checking off all these boxes like golden child for my parents the eldest uh achieving everything they wanted me to achieve the next thing on the list was so I, out of school started a job got a place for myself and then the next thing on the list was getting married and mm-hmm. i was getting a lot of pressure and this is where i alluded to earlier on the cultural side there's a lot of pressure from my parents uh, around me getting married they had already gotten my sister married so i was feeling that pressure but deep down, I didn't think I was, I, I, looking back, I, I didn't feel like I was ready. So I was almost going through the motions of finding a partner to appease my parents and almost get them off my back too. And wow. um, this is no knock on my ex-partner, but we got married and things were not great. And there's obviously a lot of things that I brought to the table. I had unhealed childhood patterns that I hadn't really dealt with. And first time in my life, when I was going through the separation and divorce, I felt what I had internalized at that time through the shame I was experiencing because of failure. And it was the first time I had actually failed at something because even when things got tough throughout school or in life in general, I powered through it. But this was one thing I came to the conclusion that I cannot 
power through it. I have to accept the fact that either I move away from this relationship or I'm just going to be unhappy and that's not going to serve anyone in my life, including my son. And uh, so I have to make that decision. Um, so for the first time, fortunately, because of the shame, I didn't really feel comfortable talking to anyone about it. My parents were also not fully on board, again, because of the cultural implications. In fact, they still haven't told, it's been like six years, over six years, they still haven't told their immediate family members about my divorce, which oh, I wow. still chuckle about. Yeah, so so there's a lot, a lot of shame there. So I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't even know how to talk about these things with my parents. So I gravitated towards therapy. In fact, I had started seeing a therapist before I uh, went through a separation and and then therapy really got me through and my needs for therapy also evolved. So I worked with three or four therapists over the course of, uh, I'd say, a year and a half or almost two years. And I've stayed with the last one. I still see her occasionally, but it brought a lot of things to the forefront, a lot of things that I hadn't dealt with from childhood, a lot of coping mechanisms I had and, and there's still a lot of things that still keep coming up and that's what I believe is a lifelong journey and I'm okay with that too and there's that acceptance there but the second piece that came to me was this whole aspect of isolation and shame that we men experience in this world and a lot of it is because of how we get socialized and conditioned early in life and for me, I always felt emotions, but I never really had a way of expressing them, nor was I encouraged. So that was the biggest issue that I realized during my therapeutic work. And Amen. part of me, as I was seeking this idea of what my purpose in life were to be or what it needs to be, that's where I got Call, I felt like there was this calling of being an advocate for men on their mental health journey, and it doesn't always have to be divorce. So I was toying with the idea of becoming a therapist. And then while I was in between jobs, I did some undergrad courses in psychology, and then the pandemic hit, and I was already thinking of applying for a master's, but that timing couldn't have been any better. I, I applied for a master's in psychology, which I uh, finished last year. And, and now I'm working in the therapy world. But a lot of it, to your point, has been what's been really powerful is not only have I had to deal with things myself and have this sense of humility, but also acceptance for other people's issues or challenges without having that sense of judgment. Whereas if I were to do this career pivot 10 years ago, I don't think I would show up the same way because my own issues would be getting in the way. And in fact, I was, I did a podcast episode with a, a, another therapist who's been working in the field for 50 years. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me is he gave the analogy of tuning musical instruments, right? So he said a lot of these older musicians, they could just listen. For example, if they're tuning their guitar, they just knew how to tune it by listening, right? They didn't even need a tuning fork. And he's like, that's our role as a therapist is how can you just be present and help your client, just like a musician tunes their guitar, that mm -hmm. your presence is resonating with them and they can feel like they can follow you along. And that really stuck with me because what that really means to me is, is the testament to the work we therapists need to put in on ourselves. If we're not fully aligned, if we're not healing ourselves they're not we're not in we're not being authentic with our with our clients right and that was one of the biggest things where three years ago i made significant shifts in my life even though i was seeking therapy i was still engaging in behaviors and coping mechanisms that weren't serving me and i had to really look at myself in the mirror and say if i want to be this advocate for men's mental health then i need to start walking the walk i can't just be all talk here and I had to put the mirror to myself and start putting in the work on me before I could help others. That's profound and I love it and it's a perfect segue into the 
final area I want to talk about. So I have subscribed to and avidly read your blog on Substack, and you incorporate psychology, philosophy, wisdom, and Islam all in one. And uh, while I am not a member of any faith, and I certainly wasn't raised with any knowledge of Islam, except like living in the Bay Area, where we're very, very tolerant to all religions, and we just kind of shut up and don't say anything. But with that said, in my career as a book indexer, I have indexed like so many books on Pakistan, on Islam, on it, just like everything that I think connects into like your adult life. So before we get into your relationship to all that, I would like you to first answer the standard question of the podcast, which is what do you think happens when you die? But with a twist, which is, is that or is that not affected by Islam? Hey, everyone. If you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com. Thanks. Uh... Well, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to navigate this question because it is pretty profound for, for obvious reasons. But for me also, it's been a deep exploration. Um, so initially, you know, growing up, and this is, I'll pretext this with, I've always been inspired and fascinated by people that, for example, convert to Islam specifically because that's my faith background. Mm-hmm. I, I was always intrigued because I'm like, why is this person choosing this? Like, what did they find or see that provoked them or motivated them to choose this as their faith? So that's one thing. And and the reason why I say that is because I often just wondered, like, I didn't have the answers. I was always inquisitive at, at an early age where a lot of times my parents were like, oh, you have to do this. And I'm like, why? And they're like, you don't ask questions. And this is part of my issue with, and I can only speak to my faith. I'm not going to get into other faith-based systems, but in my faith, it's like, there's a sense of just, just doing things at face value without really trying to understand why, right? So that was always my challenge. So I was, what I came to understand at an early age was, okay, you die and you go to this place, it's called heaven. And I was like, okay, well, sure, whatever. But it was just, the the idea didn't make sense to me. Then as I was going, leading up to my separation and going through the process of divorce, looking back, I kind of laugh at it, but I had this rebellious approach towards God. I felt like, you know, I was this good person. I, in my naive sense, I was this good person doing all the things right and, and trying to make everyone happy. And yet I had to suffer. And, and a lot of people get stuck in this and have their own version of religious trauma. That was the extent of mine where I was like, well, I'll show God. And, and funny enough that the joke was on me. <laughs> but over the last few years, I had some experiences in life, and as I was making changes in my own life, I had a deeper connection with what I now understand is is God. And I've had to come to that realization and go through that experience on my own without anyone influencing it. And what I've also come to realize is that my relationship with whatever this being is and however we can comprehend it to the best of our abilities is very private. So I don't need to answer to other people how I practice my faith, how I do this connection, um, what I do in my personal life. That's just between me and my creator. I don't need to justify anything. Mm -hmm. And as part of it over the last couple of years, I'd say two years ago, um, my grandma passed away and leading up to her death, I was really contemplating my own mortality. And I was having all these vivid images and and sensations that or deep feeling that, oh, I may die. And I had to sit with it and get comfortable with that because there was so much discomfort around leaving my son behind and not really finishing whatever mission I had in mind for myself, I had to come to this level of acceptance that it's still okay. Uh, It's going to happen one day. But my idea of this whole thing that I was told early on in life that you go to this place, heaven has also changed because for me, it's like, yeah, I may go somewhere. I don't know what it is. It's some metaphysical place. 
but it's going to be cool. And I feel like you can still create that for yourself in this world too, by the choices you make and how you choose to live your life. This is part of why I was excited to have you on because you're not just a therapist and you're not just intelligent. You're also a podcaster, so you know how to talk, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, so thank you. I did want to ask if you have any sort of like suggestion to those of us on the sidelines who are not avidly into any religion watching what we talk about with like, not just in the Middle East, but all over Earth, like this polarizing, mm -hmm. weird feeling people have about like all of these Western religions, like the major three Abrahamic mm -hmm. faiths, but then also, you know, throw Hinduism mm -hmm. in because Pakistan is a country because of Hinduism and Islam, you know, and stuff like that. So I mean, mm -hmm. just do you have any sort of like peaceful or like somewhat like helpful approach for all of us? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on where you are in terms of your own spiritual growth, because I think you can separate the two, um, because there's that huge, I think a lot of people get stuck in the dogma, which I think was my biggest issue with people of my faith and what drove me away until I had to understand. And this is what I like to tell people also who have religious trauma from their upbringing is what I notice with them, especially from a therapeutic standpoint too, is they've associated people and their behaviors with God. Mm -hmm. And then they, they tend to rebel against the, this idea of God. And the second piece I would like to add is, and again, I can only speak to Islam is Islam is very cautious, I suppose, and deliberate around not trying to define God. It's often throughout our religious text, it mentions that God is formless. And in fact, in our religion, God has 99 different names. So that just gives you an idea of how you can't fully encapsulate wow. this being into one word. Um, so that's something else I would like to say is like, people often get stuck and, and they visualize God as this man in the sky or they even try to picture it, and it's like, well, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be whatever you're able to connect to, that can be your God. So I, I try to share that with people. That could be a good starting point. And then the third piece I would say is be really open, and what, that's what I've done is in my exploration, I've tried to understand the uh, Judeo-Christian faith system and with an open mind. And I've taken a lot of value out of that too. And I haven't pushed back. I've also started to dip my toes in understanding the, the Hinduism side of things, especially the, the Gita. Uh, I plan on reading that in further detail. I spent a lot of time reading about different ancient philosophies, uh, the Eastern philosophies and, and the I Ching and, and all of that. So I've been open to various ideas and, and not closing myself off. And I've often found a lot of similarities and commonalities within all of them. And for me personally, based on my exploration and perhaps part of because of my intimacy with the religion, I still come back to Islam because that I believe gives me all the answers at the end of the day. Now, not everyone needs to come to that conclusion, but the only thing I can offer is be open, do your research. And I try to apply that same logic when there are debates within my friend circles. Um, we've touched on the Middle East, especially with the conflicts that are happening there. I have friends that will take are, are on both sides. Yeah, me too. And I feel kind of grateful to be in that position because I can hear both sides of the argument. And I have. Obviously, I, I've, taken a, I've taken a side on it, but I, I'm very cautious on how I take that side because I've still gone out and tried to educate myself mm -hmm. as best as possible so I can... And for me, when I say educate, I try to educate myself and put myself in the shoes of the other person and try to find answers to questions that they may ask so then I can have an educated debate with them without it being hostile, but without also taking aside and just saying well that's the way it is and yeah. that's where i think a lot of issues arise whether it's based on faith or whether it's based on war 
people don't necessarily spend the time to understand things so they can speak to it in a in an informed manner. Um, and, and I think that's our responsibility as individuals, especially if we're going to be a part of society and culture. Yeah, your answer and your approach was so interesting to me. And it really hit home. Like when I hear friends arguing, like I have friends who are going to vote for Donald Trump and I have friends who are going to vote for Kamala Harris. And like, it's this, it's very yeah. similar to me. And it's and yes, I have my opinions. And yes, I have thoughts. But like, to me, it's much more important to be positive and open minded and to tell people exactly what you said, like do research, do your due diligence and all that. So thank you. That was a very thoughtful, very helpful answer. Last on the docket, so to speak, uh, I would love for you to explain mm-hmm. not only the name of your company, you know, ya Zen Incorporated, but also just like why you chose and what you know, ya is. Yeah, yeah. So I was asked that a few months ago too, and and uh, I'll, again, there's <laughs> two two ways of answering this question. The first is uh, when I was picking the name of the company, I spent a lot of time researching, and at the time, what resonated for me was Unoya, and Unoya is a Greek word for a beautiful mind, and that was something I was aspiring for for myself, but I didn't know fully at the, at that time. Over time, it, my understanding of the word and how I related to it also evolved. And I appreciated the f- fact that it, it really means a beautiful mind. Uh, early on, it just sounded like a cool word and cool meaning. But as I started to step into that process and in that direction, it started to mean more to me. And that's kind of the idea is my goal as a therapist or in supporting other people is to help them build this beautiful mind that is full of grace and is tenacious and tough because ultimately that's what our role in this world is. We are meant to experience adversity. We are meant to find meaning from it, and we are meant to then have compassion and empathy for others. And that's kind of what I hope to inspire in others. Uh, the the other reason why I spent so much time researching it is because I did the same process when my son was born. I, I just didn't want to pick a name that sounded cool. I wanted to have significance. And in our culture, we often pick a name based on the meaning as well. So <clears throat> when I was researching names for my son, uh, his name is Mustafa, and that means the chosen one. And that really appealed to me at the time. So I kind of went through the same process because I, I thought it was really interesting and, and uh, cool to go through that process of picking, the, uh, picking a name for my son. So, so there, there's kind of a couple of things that went into it. That's awesome. That was, wow, very cool. We do always give our guests the floor. So if there's any last thing you want to leave for our listeners to find out, and like I said, everything will be in the notes for how to find you. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, If anyone's ever interested, I'm always open to conversations. And that doesn't mean that I'm looking to offer my services. It's more of a dialogue, Uh, whether it's questions around my faith and how I've come to understand it differently. I'm super jacked about sharing that. And I feel like I'm also on a journey myself in exploring. So I don't claim to have any answers. It's just i a firm believer, especially in the society we live in, with all the polarizing views we have, we have seemed to convince ourselves that somehow we figured it out and everyone else doesn't know or they're lost but in fact the truth is always somewhere in the middle and my belief is when we work together and we go on this exploration together we can get closer to the truth collectively rather than individually and that's my view Uh, like if you have an answer and i have an answer together we can get closer to the answer and and that's how i like to view things that is so awesome and as my mom always says uh from your lips to god's ears and all 99 of them that was awesome for con thank you so much um really great interview for me i learned a lot and um again your 
patient, honest, and kind approach to life is just so inspirational and motivating. And so I'm so excited to introduce you to my audience. And uh, please, everyone listening at home, check out his website. Like I said, it's in the notes. And if you want to support this podcast and the show and my family, please head over to MikeyOp.com and consider becoming a premium subscriber. You help keep the paywall off for other people who can't afford to pay. Um, thank you so much. Once again, my name is Mike Oppenheim. You are listening to Coffin Talk, and we will see you soon.